One way in which they stimulate the economy is by bringing down the cost of borrowing of money so that they get us excited to go back to the banks and borrow more money, right? So that you still... He's a hustler, unbreakable, a people's person, and a future billionaire. This is The Hustler's Corner with Smoothie Soliope, well known to you and I as DJ Smooth. In actual fact, I'm writing a chapter in my book. My book was finished, and then I was like, let me write a bonus chapter and have it ready, you know? Ah, oh, you I finished the book! Yeah, she's kept the promise, guys. She's finished with the book. Well done, I'm proud of you. Thank you so much. So we're currently typesetting. But I'm writing a bonus chapter, and it's a chapter on love and money, and, and relationships and money. And I, and I tell the story about how I once dated this man who I thought was the most good-looking man in the world. You know, um, I went to go and take out a store card from uh, Ed, Edcon, one of the Edcon shops. Né? And I was, I think I was 17 years old at that time, in first year in varsity. Went to go and take out this uh, store card, only to find out that the store card has got some life insurance policy. Né? With the life insurance policy on it, it had a death benefit. They asked me, who is your beneficiary? Not <laughs> At <six laughs> years old. As I didn't write my mother, I didn't write my father, I wrote this young man's name. Then um, the relationship started taking a dive, it wasn't going really well. And one of the nights, I woke up in the middle of the night, Silent, by the way, we stayed in rest, ne? on single beds. But I would leave my own rest room to go and cook sister with someone on a single bed. It, it just shows you how much sometimes logic goes out the window. But the one night I woke up, I'm That's yes, there's no putty movie, yes, because I guess this is you know. And that generally also happens with, with, with finance. I always find that a lot of people, once you've had a conversation about them about something, it's almost like you're taking off blinkers of their eyes. And once you take blinkers of people's eyes, you start to realize that actually. Things are not always as you think they are. And that's similar to finances. For me, the most basic things to learn when it comes to your finances really is just understanding what is the importance of saving? Why do we need to start saving? Why do we need to invest? What, how does ins uh, insurance work and why is insurance important? And then last but not least, how do you make sure that with everything that you are doing, if you're going to get debt, you make sure that that debt is working with you and your financial situation. You know, I've, I've started doing one-on-one -on -one sessions, right? And, and, and they are an hour session. And I kid you not, Smoo, 80% of those one-on-one -on -one sessions get the, get the end uh, within 30 minutes' time. Because I say, actually, you don't need me. You need to budget. You need to make sure that when an economic interference happens in your life, you are covered for that economic interference. An economic interference could be anything. It could be a death in the family. It could be a, a, a temporary or permanent disability. It could be getting into a car accident. Do you understand? It's simple things like that, Spoo, that we don't account for. When they happen, the problem is that they take you off course. So it's, it's a, again, another example I'll give you. You, you, you are running. You are jogging. Uh, level four allows us to jog now. You get out of your house. You stand at the gate. You start stretching. You are stretching. You are getting ready to jog. As you are getting ready to jog, you see someone else jog in front of you. The first thing that goes into your head is, I guess I'm piling. I get to like to owner. There you are now. You are jogging. You are jogging. You are following this person. And as you keep following this person, what so happens is that because in your mind your goal has now been shifted. Your goal is no longer the fact that you are jogging for health. You are jogging to stretch your body. Now it's about profit to owner. You pass where you are supposed to turn. You 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 find out after thirty minutes that actually I'm at the wrong place here. You don't even realize the route, but it's because you got off course. And the problem is that if you stay off course, you will get lost. And many people stay off their course when it comes to their finances. But they're comparing their finances to somebody else. They are choosing products that have nothing to do with them. You know, one of the biggest things that makes me cringe smooth, when I come on the internet is when people are saying, which insurance policy are you with? Is it cheaper? Or, 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 where are you investing? 
we, we, we can't all be investing in the same thing. We don't all have the same financial goals. We don't all have the same time period. We don't all have the same amount of money to be able to invest. So I think it's important that when you are young, and in actual fact, from every age that you are moving through, when it comes to your finances, remember that those finances are about you. It's your finances. It's called personal finance for a reason. It's your finances, which means that you need to look at your situation and ask yourself the question, Jorge, do I need to go and get one, two, three, four? Do I really, I mean, you know, I, I, I was a week ago, I was really upset with myself. I was upset with um, my fellow personal finance coaches. I was upset with anybody that does financial education because the one question that keeps coming up during this lockdown is, should I invest in shares? Should I be investing in shares? Hey, Nicolette, I saw Sasol shares have gone down. Should I be investing in Sasol shares? What it says to me is that we have done a bad job. Rona, we have done a very bad job at educating people because that question should easily be answered by a person. A person should say, okay, actually, let me give you another scenario. Yeah. The reason why people in Forex... I love them. They're my favorite people. People in Forex have mastered the art of being able to use people's lack of discernment and, in, uh, and convenience of wanting things to be given to them in their hands. Let me give you a proper example. Most people who do Forex don't really make their money from trading, right? Or they generally won't put in their own money when it comes to trading. They will say, it's like, let us trade for you. That's the one way. The second way they'll say is we put together a strategy. And that strategy of theirs generally has what we call signals. Ne? Signal of whether you should be putting more money in a certain pairing. I guess they work in pairs. So generally for anybody who doesn't know, by the way, forex trading is the buying and selling of money. Let's just simplify it, right? Now, one of the biggest things is you need to be able to see and identify when there is going to be a currency movement. So in other words, when will the dollar drop or when will the dollar rise against whatever currency you are pairing it with, right? So it's, so at some level, it's economic indicators that you should be able to be able to predict one or be able to identify, right? Now, let me give you a, a parallel example. Pula. Pula. As a month of Nyama, we are one of the women upon who begging upon the person. Who's the Ibona? There's a dark cloud day. Matiesa. Matiesa in Pula. Right? You know that. Because over the years, you've had to learn to be able to pick up on signals of when it's about to rain. It's the same thing when it comes to money. You need to be able to know how to pick up the signals of when something is going to happen. So whenever people ask me this question about, should I be investing in shares right now? The first thing I ask myself is, I've really done a bad job in trying to educate people. For it. What are shares? How do you invest in shares? When do shares make money? Because at this point in time, if you just take a simple thing, like let's take ComAir. Come air, or let's even take another another airline. Right now, during the lockdown, most countries have closed their borders. So they said no traveling, which means that there essentially or there essentially should be no airplanes in the air. So of course the stock market is going to take a beating when it comes to the airline industry. So the likes of your your, your airline uh, stocks are probably going to take a big beating, right? But we do know that COVID-19 and the lockdown and the bans on travel are not going to last forever. forever. Also, we know for a fact that a company, for a company to be listed on any stock exchange, there are certain financial soundness that a company needs to comply with. Of course, there will always be exceptions like sign off, right? Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is, will the airline shares come back up? I mean, that's... that's of course. Thing. Of course. So should you then be investing in airline shares? That's not right at, now, a basic, at a basic level, right? At a basic but, level, yes, I would, because they're, yeah. at, their, at, their, they're at, at their lowest, right? Exactly. It's almost like buying an avocado. We know what it... We'll two avocados for 50 rand, right? 
Now, the reality is that if Woolworths is selling you two avocados for 60 rand, and then there's a huge supply of avocados, if there is a huge supply of avocados and a small demand, it means that the people who are demanding avocados have the right to dictate what the price is going to be of avocados. Mm. Which means that all these suppliers of avocados are going to, at some point, if they don't want to lose their money, they're going to have to bring down the price of avocados. So essentially, that's what's happening. We're saying, if you are going to be investing in any asset right now, the best way to be investing is to find what we call value assets. Invest in assets that are trading below their actual real value. Because when the market resets itself, what is essentially going to happen, the moment the demand of avocados goes back up, and the supply is becoming a little less and a little less and a little restricted. Now the suppliers themselves can say, actually, that's 50 rand for two avocados. I let's make it 120. So Mama What do you do at okay. a sale? You buy. Right? Exactly. But it's also important that as people, we need to define what our investing strategy is. With everything in finance, you need to define what your strategy is when it comes to your finances. And let me give you another example. So, so, so at a high level, it may seem like, yes, invest in shares. But smooth, you and I are not the same person. Let me give you an example. Let's say I've got a child. My child is five years old. And I'm investing because I want my child, right, to be able to go to university. Which means if my child is five years old, and let's say they go to university at age 20, I still have 15 years to be able to invest. Let's say you have perhaps you want to buy you, 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 you want to buy yourself a house, right? And you've decided that you're going to raise the capital through investment, but you want to buy your house in the next three years. Now, you and I, the, the question about should I invest in shares looks very different for me and you. Why? Because for me, I've got 15 years to play with the stock market. So I can still buy and hold, right? Whereas with you, you might be like, okay, but I need to take money out in the next three years. Will the market have resetted in three years? Will I get the value that I really want in three years? And the answer might be no to you then of course you should not be buying any shares. So that's why I say to people, you should be able to make the decision on based on your own finances of whether or not it is a right time for you to make a certain financial move. Very, very important. So, so it's the same thing with all assets. And remember, it's also important to remember how the market works. For instance, when you are investing in bonds, you are investing in scholar. Let's talk a little bit about bonds and, and shares and all those stuff, right? The Reserve Bank in South Africa, because of lockdown, we're seeing that there is a slowing down in economic activity. So because there's a slowing down in economic activity, it means that they need to be able to stimulate the economy in some way. One way in which they stimulate the economy is by bringing down the cost of borrowing of money so that they get as excited to go back to the banks and borrow more money, right? So that you stimulate the economy. Yes. Say, say that again, slower. So, so, so when there is a slowing down in the economy, one way that the Reserve Bank and the Monetary Policy Committee can try to revive or to stimulate activity within the economy is to make it cheaper for South Africans to be able to borrow money. Because when you make it cheaper for people to borrow money, they're going to borrow money. But for a lot of people, because it was, I mean, at, 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 at one point, the interest rate in this country was sitting at 10.75. So a lot of people were, uh, uh, were like, yo, it's expensive for me to borrow money. It's expensive for me to buy a car on loan. It's expensive for me to buy a house on loan, right? So a lot of people were now not being active in the economy. They were holding on to the money that they've got and they were trying to service the debt that they've got. But when you lower the interest rates in the economy, you essentially what you're doing is you are encouraging more people to get involved. So they're essentially saying to you, go and borrow money, go and borrow money so that we can get the economy activated, right? Or to, to, to start seeing a little bit more activity, right? Now, that means that the bond market itself is growing if you get more people to go in and borrow money, right? 
So, so, so you need to, and, and the reason why I bring this up is certain economic situations are going to spur on other economic issues, situations. Yeah, it's a ripple effect, right? It's a ripple, exactly. It's a ripple effect. And to be quite honest, it's also important to understand that at any point, the different shares, uh, or not shares, asset classes. So your asset classes would be your 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 real estate, which is real estate shares, which real estate property, real estate trust, uh, 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 investment trust. Then you're going to get your stock market, which is your JSE listed um, or any stock exchange listed stocks of listed com yeah. public companies that are listed. And then you get what we call bonds, which is basically investing in scholar or top. And then you get um, cash, cash equivalents, which is your money markets and, and any other cash equivalents, right? And then you get commodities, which are your everyday products whose prices and, 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 and value changes at any given time based on the supply and demand that is coming from the actual market in which they operate, right? Now, of all these different asset classes, it is not always green for all of them. When one is up, the other is down. When the other is up, the other is down. That's why we talk in investment about what is called asset allocation. You need asset to have allocation. Yes. Okay. So, so if, if the question is, if you have a hundred rand, if you have a hundred rand, what do you do with this hundred rand that at least will give you a different taste of the different asset classes? So how much of a percentage are you allocating to real estate? How much are you allocating to the stock market? How much are you allocating to cash? How much are you allocating to bonds? How much are you allocating to, to commodities? Now, of course, you don't always have to have all those asset classes in your asset allocation. But asset allocation, what it also does, Boo, is it, it, it speaks to that adage about you can't have all your eggs in one basket. And that being, it's called diversification. As official uh, pen said, you've got to diversify. The people right now who are panicking about stock market, they are panicking because really they don't have a strategy. They don't have proper asset allocation and they are not diversified. So they have over-invested in the stock market. And that is why they are panicking. But it's also important to remind people that just because your portfolio is taking a beating now, doesn't mean that you've made any loss yet. And I want to re re uh, 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 repeat that. Just Say that again. I learned this from a, a young gentleman by the name of Sandy Dishes. He taught me what you said. Don't panic. Don't panic. Relax. Go, Relax. go, go. So let me go back with it. So if you have bought, and I'll go back to my avocado example, because my avocado example is my favorite. If you have bought 10 avocados at 10 rand, you have spent 100 rand, right? 10 avocados at, at, at 10 rand, you've got 100 rand worth of avocados. When the avocado price or the market of avocados drops to an avocado being worth 5 rand an avocado, essentially your avocado portfolio is now sitting at 50 rand, yet you have spent 100 rand. But you should not panic because the price of avocados is not 5 rand. You know the real price of avocados is not 5 rand. So essentially, what you the only time you will lose is if you panic and you decide to sell because now you're mm. selling at 50 rand. Oh, no. oh, yes. Yes. So you, so what you do is when you sell, you are locking in those losses. But what we say to people, and, and, and it's a big thing about um, 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 uh, Warren Buffett that he loves saying is buy to hold. One of his investment approaches is buy to hold and buy companies that are still going to be here in 20 years time. Right? So let's go back again to why a lot of people also are panicking right now. People are panicking because when you ask them a question, what type of investor are you? But on the whole, I just invested in shares. But you can't do, you can't just invest for the sake of investing. Because when you invest for the sake of investing, it's like getting out of your house, getting into your car and driving and not knowing where you're going. You need to have what is called goal-based investing. Goal-based investing says, look at what you want to achieve. What are your goals? And let me use another analogy. And, and, and I use the analogy of a car. I say, 
when you get in, when you are choosing what investment to be making, you need to say, what is my destination? Where is the place where I can say I have arrived? So, and, and your arrivals are going to look different because there is your short-term arrivals, your mid-term arrivals, and your long-term ar arrivals. Again, so let's make it like this. Let's say your short-term arrivals, your mid-term arrivals is to go to Mpumalanga, to go to window. And then your long-term arrivals, we are going to New York. Again. So that's your short-term, your mid-term, and your long-term goals. Now, what you've got to ask yourself is, what type of vehicle do I get into to get to Pretoria? But because I need to get to Pretoria in 12 months, what type of a vehicle am I getting into to get to Pretoria in 12 months? What type of a vehicle am I getting into to get to Mpumalanga in three years? What type of a vehicle am I getting into to get to New York in 10 years' time? Those are the questions you've got to ask yourself. What you are now doing is you are saying, I'm working backwards. I've got these goals. I need to achieve these goals. I only have so much money that I can allocate to investing. And, and it's important, by the way, to take you guys a couple of steps back when it comes to investing and savings. On your budget, there is a simple principle called pay yourself first. Of course, in South Africa, because of SARS, it's very difficult to pay yourself first because some will always take their money before you. But the salary that... Because anyway, anyway, you know, and, 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 and I want to also... And I know I'm going all over the place, but I'll bring it back. No, no, no. Me. You're going to make it to make sense soon. Yeah. I understand, yeah. Just what keep bending, people Don't talk after. Yeah. If, when you are negotiating your salary, Eman, at the very least, how the it takes table before you go to negotiate? You know, there's nothing that pisses me off, and I'm sorry for my language. There's nothing that frustrates me Boom. than a person going in to negotiate a salary increment, and then they push themselves into another bracket, and then the salary increment means nothing. We need to make sure that people, before they walk into jobs, or before they walk into their boss's offices, make sure that you negotiate the money you take home. How much tax needs to be paid? That ain't your problem. When you walk in there, you don't say to my your boss, I want to earn 30,000 rent. You say, I want to take home 30,000 rent. Mm. Because this way is the best way for you to be able to practice the principle of paying yourself first. I will not have a mm. 15 must go to SARS. That's not your business. That ain't your story. You are not worried about that because you made peace with the fact that your actual salary is 30,000 rent. And now, that's what, that is what you call... That's what you would call the net yes. salary, right? Yes, the one that hits your bank account. Now, with that 30000 one of the first things you are supposed to be doing is to pay yourself first. But you can only do this if you have an actual budget in place. It has to be a line on your budget to say savings and investment, and you've got to make an allocation to it. So, in other words, what people are doing now that I see is that when they've got a lump sum or when they've got some sort of cash wind, that's when they go and buy shares like this. And I'm not thinking process, is it? No. It's important for you to sit down and say, these are my goals. Each of these goals need a certain amount of money for me to access a certain amount, a certain car to get into and drive to that goal. So, for instance, let's take the two. Let's take the first two. Let's take your Pretoria and let's take Nile Sprite. You gotta say to yourself, I've got 12 months to get to Pretoria. So, what car can I get into to go to Pretoria? Generally, your short term uh, 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 investments, they generally have elements of savings. So, you're actually more interested in making an uh, 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 in, uh, income from interest. So, you want to earn interest. Now, that means that the vehicles that you're going to be looking at are not long-term vehicles that are dependent on appreciation of a, 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 an asset. They are more long-term. That's when you start now obsessing over getting high interest rates or high interest-bearing type of accounts. I often hear people saying, yo, I'm investing in this education policy for my child, but it only gives me 8%. Yeah, but your child is like two months old. You still have 18 years. What are you panicking about? You know, what is the point of going high risk, chasing returns, and then losing your money? Mm. You know, 
So rather, when, when you are looking long term, go with something that is conservative or go with something that is high risk, but there's a mix of when you go high risk, you could go high risk for the first couple of years and then you could swap it into like conservative risk and then at the end you could do proper value preservation. So those things are really important for you to be able to look at and say, what am I investing for? Because if I know what I'm investing for, I will know which car to get into. Then the thing is, when you are getting into a car to go to Pretoria, now you've got to ask yourself, how much money do I have? So with the money, if you've got 3,000 rand that you can put into investments, then you can say, okay, maybe I can hire a sports car to get to Pretoria. And maybe I can get there before 12 months. Or you can say, Yazin, I don't have enough money to allocate to this uh, uh, specific uh, 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 goal. So let me get into a maybe a lesser car that is more safe, but is still moving at a steady pace and will get me to Pretoria within 12 months. Or you can say, you know what? Things are not great right now. So I need to get into a public transport that I know could break down on the side of the road. But if it breaks down, I've got a way to pivot, right? Very important, again, to be able to do those things. So this all this thing that all it's doing is it's building your investment DNA. Because we all have different investment DNAs. Over and above that, there's a thing that we call financial psychology that you've got to also be well aware of as a person. Most of us come from families where money was traumatic, money was scarce. So there are people that have a scarce mentality, a scarcity mentality. That person will probably have difficulty putting money away for long term. Then we say that person needs to see a financial psychologist to be able to work through their financial constraints and barriers that are stopping them from being able to invest. Then there are people who panic, people who generally panic because they have not built their financial emotional intelligence. When something happens in the market, and they take their money out. But what they're essentially doing is they keep resetting the clock. And one of the most important ingredients of investing or even saving is what we call compound interest. Because for your 100 rand, to, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chicken scenario. I want to say to people, you get a female chicken, I'll get a, me, a male chicken, let's get our chicken slangana ring. Because when our chicken slangana, all of a sudden, we've got six. But in Kuku, more chickens within 12 months, you are not going to have a thousand chickens because it's biologically impossible. So that's why you've got to give them time to be able to zala those chickens. And the best thing is, don't eat the chickens that the chickens make. It's as simple as that. So even with investment, you've got to understand that you can't eat the interest. Because if you eat the interest, they can't zala anymore. They can't multiply. So that's another ingredient that's important. But the problem is also, if you, if you prematurely stop the compound interest from Ugu Zala, because you are panicking, because let's say they say there is a swine, uh, what? bird flu, and then you are like, no, if bird flu is on Yenzela, I'm a tight high, Lana. Let me rather uh, kill all my chickens. You've stopped compound interest. So now when you start, you're going to restart it again. So mm. that's why we say you then need to go and see a financial psychologist because they need to deal with why you have so much anxiety when it comes to money. Because people are anxious. Then there's another thing called biases. We've got a lot of biases. Excuse people. me, it's called what? I'm a biases. Biases, okay. Like being so biased you, towards... Yeah, let me get, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So you are biased about certain things because you've got pre-existing information about certain things. So you okay, don't yes. see them. One of the two, or the two biggest biases that we, we know, one is called confirmation bias. Let me give you an example of confirmation bias. Last year, a friend of ours was turning 26. Yeah. We're in a WhatsApp group. He sends, in the WhatsApp group, he sends a poster that says, Richmond turning 26 in New York. Now, the first thing everybody asks there is, eh, sorry, which New York is this? Is it New York in Cosmo City? Yeah, it could be the New York. I think it's the New York there in the America. 
Mm. Immediately, we had at least over six people in the WhatsApp group say, I can't make it. Then, okay, Sharp, not a problem. One of the friends that we've got also said, I can't make it. Then a couple of weeks later, I see this friend at a birthday party. Why aren't you coming to New York? It's going to be so much fun. Let's go to New York. She says, oh, what friend? Now I can't afford New York. How much is New York? She says, what do you mean? I said, how much is it to go to New York? Because Richmond has given us at least six months for us to be able to build our funds to be able to go to New York. She says, ah, I don't know, but it must be expensive. I said, let's log into SAA now and check the flights. The flights... At that Especially time, if you buy the tickets earlier. Exactly. They were less than 10,000 rand. I said, you see, you have... Besides the fact that there is information that you could have found, you have already confirmed that you can't afford to go to New York. How many people always confirm that they can't afford a chef? When you talk about, I've got a chef in my house, people are like, yo, oh, Nicolette, I'm living the life. No, 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 no. Have you actually checked what the prices are of a chef? How many people will say, I can't take a private jet to another province or to another city because they confirmed in their heads that a private jet is an expense that they cannot Or they afford. say, traveling is expensive. Traveling like, is no, expensive. it's not. We but are yeah. like expensive corner because, yes, there are travels that are expensive, but there are certainly travels that are not expensive. So you can't group everything and say it's expensive. The other bias, or oh, there's two other biases that we see. The other one is an ostrich bias. It's, it's always compounded with an avoidance personality. There are people that generally avoid their finances. They don't want, it's like, uh, rather I don't know. Brother, I just don't know. But that person every month is saying things like, yo, I don't know where my money went. Yo, I don't know my, where my money went. Hello, sit down with your bank statement and look where your money is going. Because your bank statement will tell you the truth. Because your bank statement essentially is you doing what is called reflectionary budget audit. You need to audit yourself. The way you audit your relationship, Uguti, Agasendanga, it takes Namsanji. Why is he not sending a text? Oh my goodness, maybe he's losing interest. When are you going to take the time to do an audit on your finances and ask yourself, why do I keep spending so much money on data? So it's those things, but because a lot of people have what is called the ostrich uh, 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 bias, they don't want to know. So they rather stay in the dark and not know. Then one of the last biggest uh, biases that we've got is an overconfidence bias. Many people have an overconfidence about their finances. And it's generally people that earn a lot of money. They earn more. They might not earn a lot of money. They might have access to credit. Because they know that they can afford their debts. So they budget here. But when you look at their finances, you're like, oh man, you should at least be spending only 50% of your salary. Yet that person is spending... 100 and even 110 percent why because they've got access to an overdraft because they've got access to a credit card because they've access to personal <laughs> loans forgetting that that's not their money <laughs> so, so 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 those little things count growing up in a home school where money was never preserved because it was so little that it was used all the time. Let me give an, a, a, a simple example. You know, when we're growing up, one of the words that we heard so many times from our mothers and our dads was, Emela Khwedi Fel. Emela Khwedi Fel. When you wanted something, Emela Khwedi Fel. But what your yeah. parents did not realize that they were doing is that they were teaching you that if you have the money, buy what you want. So they were not teaching you the difference between needs and wants. Now you grow up to be an adult who thinks that when they've got the money, they must buy what they want. Mm. Forgetting that as a person, you need to know and understand and you need to service your needs before you service your wants. In actual fact, we're not saying take away the ones. We're saying plan for the ones. Have a budget for the ones. Have an item on your budget that says guilt-free money. Because, let me tell you what a lot of people do. There's a gentleman by the name of Ram Ramit Sethi. Ramit speaks about what we call money dials. 
And he says the biggest problem with people and why they will never be fulfilled with their finances is because they don't want to admit their money dials. A money dial basically is a button on your body that when we press it, you get the best satisfaction. Now, because the world and society has made you to believe that you can't enjoy certain things, you shouldn't enjoy certain things because that's what you waste that life. You try to stifle yourself from your money dial. But essentially, if you satisfy your money dial, it will save you a lot of money because you won't try to do these other little things that don't give you satisfaction. So let me give you an example. I love food. I love food. That's why you to because The first three weeks, look at all color, the first one on this. It's a Three kilograms of cane. Because it's time to lose, you know? Yo, Spoo, if I can tell you how much money I've spent on groceries, it is a shock, right? So I love food. But people, if I were to say to somebody, even now on this live, if I were to say to somebody, I'm going to fly to Cape Town because I want to go and have a, a, a prawns at a restaurant on Banshee Bay. What are people going to say? Yo, Moshima, yo, oh, you could buy a floss, oh, you could buy a zan. But what people don't realize is, I can do that one thing in a month. And I'll be happy the whole month. It will cost me, mm. let's say it will cost me a flight return from Cape Town, 2.7, a meal at that uh, restaurant, another 500 rand. Let's say it cost me 3.3. Next, I can be con content with just doing that once a month. And I would look forward to doing it every single month. Because every single month I would get to go to a different city. But because people in society make me feel bad about doing that, what do I do? I now start spending my money on things that don't give me satisfaction. And because they don't give me satisfaction, they give me temporary satisfaction. So this week, Kiko Rockets, what spend? I'm spending 1.5 with Rockets. Because you know, I can, even though we know a bottle of, of gin is, is 400 rand in the bottle store, we'll still buy the Rockets at 1.8. Can spend 1.8 this week. During the week, I'm like, yo, I work so hard. You know, I'm actually so upset. Why seven Zelani? Friday, the Saba food, the rocket food, only 1.8. The next weekend, again at rocket, 1.8. The next weekend, 1.8 again at rocket. One day you wake up and you realize that you're actually spending over 5,000 rand on just entertainment. But it's because the entertainment that you're doing is what you think is socially acceptable. Because you are, you are essentially, you are, are not doing what is your money dial. You as a person are supposed to know what your money dial is. And you are supposed to be servicing that money dial. Yes, there will be time where you will need to reflect and say, okay, but I need to cut down a little bit on food. But the little bit that you are still feeding that money dial will still give you satisfaction that you won't need to go and do all these other half-hearted things that don't actually give you any satisfaction. So it's important as a person to understand all these things because all these things essentially will dictate how you manage your finances, how you invest, how you speak to people about money, how you make financial decisions, when to learn to say no to yourself, when to learn to say yes, how to be able to make financial decisions without anxiety and without panicking about them. Let's talk a little bit about debt. There are many people in this, you know, I ask the question all the time. If you decide that you're going to buy a car, school, and the car is 200,000 rand, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to save 200,000 rand. After six months and realize, okay, I've managed to save at least uh, 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 80,000. Will you still take that 80,000 rand and put it into a car? A lot of people struggle with that. Then they say to me, no, but, but why can't I just use 50,000? And then the other 40,000, don't you stop that? Because that is the same thing as when people go and apply for loans. And if you need, let's say, for instance, your mom needs 5,000 to go to the hospital to get a hip, whatever. It's not a replacement because hip replacements are definitely not 5,000 rand, right? But let's say she needs a, a hip readjustment at 5,000 rand. You don't have 5,000 rand. You then decide, you know what? This is the time where I will go and get a loan because this makes sense for me to get a loan. We can give you 25,000. 
Now all of a sudden, in your eyes. Now you start dragging. You start, start thinking about other things. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Let me give you a story that I always tell my mom, and I learned this from my mom. My mom and my dad have a, a weird relationship. My mom will say to my dad, "Go take a sunlight." Buang, go take a sunlight. Go into dishwashing liquid. My dad will take out five hundred rand, and uh, I mean a thousand, I mean a hundred rand. Put it in my mom's hands and go and buy that uh, 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 sunlight liquid. Oh no, my mother will not come back with just sunlight liquid. Sunlight liquid. Come back with different food. Or have a regular yogurt. Or have a regular all sorts of things that were not planned. Many of us do that, and that's how banks get us to in into this uh, 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 financial trap. Because you go to the bank, you need five thousand rand. The bank says we'll give you twenty uh, thousand. Now all of a sudden you want twenty thousand. Most of the people that I'm doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with right now, most of them have a credit card or they've got a personal loan. The first thing I ask is, do you remember what you did with the personal loan? Hey, Nazi, I know. I remember when I took it. I know why I took it, but I'm not really sure what I did with the money. Ongen was group teller Nicolette. Because people don't understand how interest and how credit works. We've got this idea that when we're given credit, it's because you... <laughs> Let me rewind back. Yesterday, I was sitting with a gentleman in my house, and we're talking about finances. And he says to me, I wanted to buy a car. The car was 800,000 rand. And the bank said I can take it on a loan. I then said to him, do you realize that you can't afford that car? He said, why? But I can pay for it every month. I said, but you can't afford it. He said, no, no, no. What do you mean? I can, the, I can, the bank says I can, I can buy it. That means, I, no, you can't afford it. Let's just be clear on the fact that you can't afford the car. Let me tell you why you can't afford the car. If something is to happen to you today and your, your income stops, can you still afford to service that credit? No. Most of the time, most of us can't. So it's important, again, that when you are taking credits, you ask yourself, what am I taking those credits for? Credit is very important. Sorry to disturb you. New Phonics said something so beautiful. And all you young guys that are watching, to emphasize on what um, Nicolette just said about not being able to afford it, even if you think you can, and actually you can. Um, New Phonics said to me, if you can't afford five of it, you can't afford it. Sorry, continue. <laughs> I'll say that again. Yes. If you can't afford five of it, you can't afford it. Yes. Continue. So, 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 it, it's one of those things that you. Oh, he said. Oh, he says. So, sorry, 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 uh, sorry. That's uh, that's. I'm quoting wrong. Then I want to do some quote for you. Imagine, but if you can't afford five for the, if you can't afford five of it. Don't buy it. Yes, that's the quote. If you can't afford five of it, don't buy it yet. Mm. So, 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 and, and that is the, that that is the reality, right? And the reality is that we live in a country where it's 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 almost irrational to say to people, "Don't take credit." So then, what do we do? Smooth? What is important then is that we educate on credit. We we don't vilify credit, but we educate on it. We educate how is it that you can be smarter with credit. For instance, now when the credit rate, the credit, the, the, the interest rates have been dropped, how do you make sure that you work with the cut interest rates to your specific benefit? That, those are the most important things that we need to do. It's gone are those days where people can become complacent about their finances. This is the time when you need to wake up and say, okay, where's I gonna lie? I need my finances right now. I need to get a better understanding and better get a better hold of my finances so that I can work with the system. Because often people will say things like, oh, ha, banks, banks are scammers. Banks don't like us. Bank, 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 do this. Bank, do that. But the reality is, that at the end of the day, if you do work with the bank, it is easy for you to do to be able to pay off debt, to be able to reduce the debt. And the other thing you need to remember, guys, is that the law is on your side. I think often a lot of us don't realize that there is a National Credit Act. The National Credit Act says it is unreasonable to get somebody into a credit agreement if they cannot afford it. So by the time the bank gives you a credit line, it means that they have assessed and they have said they are complying with the national credit regulator to say that you can afford that debt.
which then means that in actual fact you should be able to pay even additional into that credit agreement for you to finish it off as quick as possible if you do find yourself in a situation because it does happen where people are given credit agreements where it is actually illegal for one salem and i always speak about where people are are, 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 are are given credit at a reckless in a reckless manner where there's reckless lending i'm giving oh. an example i spoke to a little girl uh, a young girl a little girl wow a young girl two weeks ago this young girl earns 11000 rand take home yet she's got a credit card with a limit of 45000 rand that is reckless lending i don't care who you are that is reckless lending and she should be able to go to the ombudsman and say, listen, this is reckless lending and I'm not going to pay for this. Because essentially, unless she lied about how much she earns, the bank it must take its responsibility to say, Nicolette, you can't afford, we are not going to advance this credit to you. Sorry to disturb. Yes. I'm going to shut it down and I'll switch it back on because Instagram cuts it in, in an hour and I can see we only have two minutes. Okay. Sorry, guys. The video is gonna disappear. I don't want to disappear. I just want I want Nicolette to continue and finish. I know everyone is tuned in. Some of you guys are taking notes. Big up. If you missed this interview, you missed the earlier part. Don't worry. The video will be up on Monday on my YouTube. The, sorry, on the Hustlers Corner Podcast YouTube page. Let me switch off and connect back on. Welcome back, welcome back, guys. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back, welcome back. We're speaking to Nicolette Mashile. We're talking about finances. She's schooling us about money. She's schooling us about money. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. We're talking about money. Sorry for disturbing, sorry. Oh, yes, she is. Let's go. Can't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> I even me, I was just even me means Namia, but even me, I was just thinking this video is gonna cut. I was just thinking about this. Sorry, I don't remember, but I think. Oh, we're talking about uh, 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 credit. Credit, yeah, credit, 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 credit. So, so just to recap on what we we're saying, you know, um, one of I, I, I've got a very big problem with South Africans. And, 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 and I'm, very, I'm going to be very cautious with what I'm about to say now. I've got a very big problem when South Africans come to me and say, yeah, Robert Kiyosaki says don't buy your car cash. Robert Kiyosaki says this and this and this. Robert Kiyosaki is a great, yes, we're speaking about reckless lending, but let me throw this in. Robert Kiyosaki is an amazing man who's done amazing and really great stuff. And he's managed to teach us one of the most fundamental lessons when it comes to your finances. But it's also important that when you are listening to the Robert Kiyosakis, you listen to the Suze Omens, you're listening to the Tony Robbins, you're listening to the Dave Ramseys, to listen to them within context of the country that you actually live in and the actual market that you're working in. Now, if you look at something, a place like America, America has almost zero interest rates on their loans. So, of course, it makes sense then to buy a car on a loan in America and a house on a loan in America. Because in a market where the interest rate is almost zero, you are essentially not being charged for borrowing money. Now, when you come to a country like South Africa, where the interest rate at some point was 10%, you've got to ask yourself the question of, where else can I put my money to be able to get 10% back? 
You know, people will talk about, and it's, it's smart people who will talk about opportunity cost, opportunity cost, but they forget that for the average person, the access they've got to certain investment products that will give me 10% in the short period of time that I wanted to give me 10% is not the same. And also factor in the fact that the 10% that you are paying when you are buying a car on a loan does not factor in, in most times. It's 10% that you are paying every single year. Whereas if they say to you, you're getting 10% on investment, it might be 10% in three years. It might be 10 And it's not always the real return. So I think sometimes it's important as South Africans that when we try to, 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 to make credit this thing where we say don't vilify credit or you're vilifying credit, it's important to also make sure that you are speaking about things in context of the area or the environment that you are in. And even in South Africa, and I always, uh, date, on Daily Tether, we had this conversation about South Africa is a country with two nations. You, I mean, you just need to stand in Santon and look at that nice little divide, the border that Santon has with Alex. It's such a big contrast because even with the financial systems that we've got in South Africa, a person in Alex and a person in Santon don't have the same accesses to financial situations. It's, I, I was having this conversation with um, an, an entrepreneur, I can't remember who, and we're talking about it's so funny when uh, people, uh, entrepreneurs or these business consultants who are supposed to help you build your business Forget the context on which your business survives and actually operates. People will come to yeah. you and say, do this, do that. Forgetting that for me as a black female in this country, it is probably more difficult for me to access any type of financial support when it comes to entrepreneurship than it would be for my counterpart if she was female and she was white, if, she, if he was male and he was white, if he's male and he's black. So to just simply say things like, no, you can apply here and here, it's, it's not always the same. So our situations are defined. And it's important that you work within what are the confines of the law so that you can make sure that your situation still speaks to you. Because, and for me, that is really important for us to always speak about things in context and not just come and say things for the sake of saying things. A simple thing like have an emergency fund. You know, I've been preaching have an emergency fund for years. And then one day I sat down and I was like, hey man, I also need to take in consideration that there are some people that are really living hand to mouth. And we're not talking about somebody that's living hand to mouth who's, earn, who's earning 50,000 rand and they're living hand to mouth because they've got a, an exacerbated lifestyle. We're talking about somebody who's living hand to mouth because they don't have a choice. Because in actual fact, that 5,000 rand, that person has to pay for one, two, three, four. But the funny thing is that even in that context, the person that earns 5,000 rand has better financial control over their money than the person that has 50,000 rand a month. So it's important at all times that whenever you say anything in personal finance, remember that, yes, there will always be best practice. There will always be principles of efficient money management. But remember context. Context is important. And at the same time that context is important, don't allow it to cripple you. Don't allow it to become a crutch. For you to say, I can't do this because I'm 5,000. I can't do this because And I always say this to people because I say to them, start, start saving. Then somebody will say to me, ah, Nicole, I don't have enough money to save. Then I'm like, okay, save 50 rand a month. Just 50 rand. And the person will say to me, ah, but you might money this one. Okay, yeah, that means you've got more to save. Okay? If you have 50 <laughs> yeah. rand, it means you have more to save. So it means that you can free up more to save. The reason why we say people must get into the culture of saving is to understand what are the principles of saving so that when you move from saving to investing, it doesn't now become something that is new and something that is foreign in your life. You are able to do it without having to feel like it is some sacrifice that you are making on your own life. So I think these, yes. Oh, continue, sorry. I'll ask oh. after. 